Hello my loves, it's Ro. Welcome back to my channel. If all goes well when you're watching this, it is a day before my usual upload schedule. You're getting a video on Tuesday instead of Wednesday. That's because this topic is time sensitive and I want you to have time to watch this video, digest, and then maybe watch the show for life tonight. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a review on the show for life, which is on ABC produced by 50 cent and loosely based on the life story of a man who was incarcerated for life for a crime he did not commit. If you're interested, please keep watching. If you're new here, my name is Ro. I am the founder of a nonprofit organization called Strong Prison Lives and Families, the author of a book called The Comeback Code. I've been using my experiences to coach prison wives and family members since 2009. We don't glorify or glamorize prison life or prison wife life here. We are just trying to make the best out of this not so great situation. I will teach you the tools and exercises to cope through any kind of grieving, but especially for grieving while your loved one's incarcerated. Make sure that you give this video a thumbs up, ding that notification bell, and subscribe to be notified every single time I post a new video every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and sometimes we go live on the days in between. So let me tell you a little bit of the background of the show. I'm not going to go too much into that. I like to give you the prison wife perspective as somebody who is supporting somebody on the inside and let you know from, and let you know that I'm dropping my notes. So let me read you about this show and then I will give you my opinion based off of being the loved one and supporting somebody who's also serving an unjust life sentence. Inspired by the life of Isaac Wright Jr., For Life is a fictional, serialized legal and family drama about an imprisoned man, Aaron Wallace, who becomes a lawyer litigating cases for other inmates while fighting to overturn his own life sentence for a crime he didn't commit. His quest for freedom is driven by his desperate desire to get back to the family he loves and to reclaim the life that was stolen from him. Aaron's complicated relationship with a progressive female prison warden helps shine a light on the flaws and challenges in the United States penal and legal system. The pilot episode aired on February 11th, 2020 on the ABC network. It is under the genre thriller, crime, and legal drama. Say that. Try to say that under the drama, drama, drama. Ugh. For Life was produced by 50 Cent and I was watching an interview with the real life character Isaac Right, Junior, who the show is based loosely off of. They developed a character named Aaron Wallace. I'm laughing because I keep tripping over my words. It's probably edited out, but I just make myself laugh at how much I trip over my own words. Anyhow, they created a character named Aaron Wallace based loosely off the real life story of a man who was serving an unfair life sentence for a crime he did not commit named Isaac Wright. When I was doing research for this video, I was watching an interview where the real life man, Isaac Wright, was talking about his first meeting with 50 Cent. And he said that because of his life experiences, because of the fact that he's done time, so those of you who have, can relate or those of you who support somebody who is incarcerated like me, you can relate based off of your observations of your loved one. They can size somebody up and down. They have to, it's a survival thing. It's a prison, I don't even wanna say quirk because I think it's a really good quality that they have. They can size somebody up and down and within point three seconds this man said and I agree they know how they feel about you like that they have you sized up and down so he did it with 50 cent they were kind of doing it back and forth and then eventually towards the end of the conversation he said listen I don't need contracts we don't need lawyers come to my office on Monday and I'm going to pay you the boatloads of money whatever it was like thousands of dollars maybe it was like a few thousand hundred thousand dollars I don't remember but let's get this done and Isaac said that's where he knew that they were going to work very well together. So I just loved this show. I'm not gonna go into the actors and actresses and who they are. You can Google that yourself. What I wanna talk about here is my emotions while watching this pilot. I had so many emotions. The similarities in what we as loved ones of the incarcerated go through and things that he said that really stood out to me. And I think that they will stand out to you if you have a loved one who's incarcerated. And if you don't, I think it'll be a really cool teaching moment for you guys and a learning experience for you. And then lastly, I want to kind of debunk the things that I think, I've never done time, but based off of all of my experience with somebody who's been incarcerated for 20 years, what I think is not true. I'm 
probably as the weeks progress for this show, going to make follow-up videos because there's a lot of stuff that I think wouldn't happen. As the pilot opens up and they're introducing the characters, they show this scene where it's a man that's saying, I was just like you. He was in a bar with his wife. He They showed him at the hospital with his wife while she was in labor. They just flashed to a few just really normal life experiences. And then they show a man, we don't know who it is at this point, getting thrown on a pool table and getting arrested. And his wife like, no! Sorry if that's triggering or traumatizing to any of you guys who've lived through that or something similar. Then they flash to a scene in the courtroom where where there's a lawyer and then there is the state's defense attorney and they kind of have this awkward exchange and you could tell that there is no love lost between these two. So the state's attorney says, how are you here? And the other attorney says, hard work and goodwill. And you're like, yeah, but you don't even know who he is or what's going on at this point. He's representing his client and then they kind of flash to another scene outside of court where that same attorney is being changed out back into a prison jumpsuit and you learn that he's an inmate. He was the man who was just like you and that line just sent chills through my body. And the reason it sent chills through my body is because that's the God's honest truth, you guys. There's the do the crime, do the timers out there. The people who say Adam deserves every day of his sentence or more. Like somebody who dropped a comment on one of my videos today, they need to set up death sentences for people who commit violent crimes and increase mandatory minimums. We have people, many people, inside of prison right now who are serving life sentences for marijuana that they are now making legal. What if they sentenced all of those people to death and now the government is going back on what they said was legal and, and they're changing those laws? That and based off of something that my friend Jessica Kent says all the time, a lot of you guys are here from her channel, but if you don't know who she is, Go watch her. She is an amazing prison YouTuber, but her and Christina Randall have told different stories about people that they met while they were incarcerated who went out to dinner, had a drink or two, and then got into an accident on the way home. And they were not drunk. They felt fine to drive, but they wound up catching life sentences or if you are so against having even one drink or a sip of a drink and driving, I get you. What about the person, and this is from Jess in her video the other day, what about the person who texts while they drive? Everybody's guilty of checking a text message at some point or another when they drive. So everybody could in fact wind up being just like you and then somehow catching a life sentence, even those people who are do the crime, do the time. Three hots in a cot, they deserve all this, blah, 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 blah. When you find out that he's an attorney, you learn that this is flash forward nine years after that initial scene on the pool table where he's getting arrested out of a restaurant. I don't remember if this is from the pilot episode or if this is from a YouTuber I watched that knew the real life story of this man, but apparently this guy was a business owner. He ran a nightclub and there was drug trafficking going on inside of his club. They wound up pinning the whole entire thing on him and he wound up being faced with kingpin charges, which equaled life in New York State where he was being sentenced. And he was told, you need to take the plea, you need to take the plea, they're gonna throw the book at you. And he decided, no, I am not taking a plea, I am not admitting to something that I didn't do, so I'm gonna take the case to trial. And if nobody wants to represent me, I'm gonna represent myself. And something that the real life guy said in an interview later was that, he said, I knew I was going to jail regardless because of the way they were treating me. I was a young black man. We know 100% that the system is racially biased. So he said, I knew I was going to jail. I knew that they were gonna win that day, but I also knew that I was going to win fast forward years ahead. I wasn't gonna stop fighting. They flash to a scene of his wife coming to visit him. It, she's a beautiful woman and she's a strong woman. But at one point she was kind of giving him an attitude and he's like, what's your deal? And she said, you should have taken the plea. At least you would have been home in X amount of years and you would have been able to see our kids grow up. Their daughter is about 16 now. I have to say at that point, in the pilot is when I started to get emotional because I can't say that I've never felt that way before. I can't say that I've never felt for at least a hot second that I wished that Adam had taken the plea so this would be over. But like this man, he was asked to lie about 
that's somebody he didn't even know. He was asked to be a snitch. He was asked to do the wrong thing so the right thing, whatever that is, could happen. He exercised his right as a United States citizen, his right to go to trial. And unfortunately, he was punished. Aaron Wallace was punished. Isaac Wright, the real guy, Adam Clausen, my husband, and many, many thousands of more people have been punished because they didn't go along with the prosecutor's little plan and they got the book thrown out them. There is no such thing as a fair trial anymore, if you ask me. And the way that this man said it was so beautiful in this interview, he said, the United States has the perfect system in place. It is a beautiful system. It's not the system that fails us. It is the people that are put in those positions that aren't equipped to be doing them. They don't have the ethics. They, they don't have the moral code instilled in them to execute this system the way that it was designed to do. That was such a mind-blowing mic drop moment for me because I feel myself getting so bitter against this system and the United States system is horrible and it needs to be reconstructed from the ground up. But the thing is, he's absolutely right. But it's not like we're stoning people. It's not like we don't have these trials that give people or were meant to give people a fair shot and a second chance. It's just that if you have an insecure prosecutor or a judge that has a vendetta against a certain race, a certain sexual orientation, or whatever that case is, then you're going to start fulfilling your own agenda and prosecuting and throwing the book at the people you have a vendetta against. The next scene that sticks out to me is a scene from where they're on the yard and Aaron Wallace is a black man. I think I said that already. They have him talking to a guy named Wild Bill who is the shot caller for the white guys. The shot caller for anybody who's not involved in prison is just basically the head of the white guys. So let me stop and explain this. Prison is racially segregated. It just is. It's just the way that it operates. It's just the way that it runs in there. It's very racially segregated. Every race has what they call a shot caller, which is the main person who, as the name says, calls the shots. They make the decisions for their race. So that might sound scary, but actually that helps prisons run more smoothly. I should probably do a whole video about this because a lot of times the shot callers from different groups will converse with each other. They will kind of squash things before it gets out of hand or before riots in sight or things like that. A lot of times the issues, the drama that's going on are between two people of different races that can be resolved between those two and it not erupting into a big riot between the two races. There are times where the shot caller says that has to be dealt with. It's just how it is. In fact, staff and administration of the prison relies on the fact that their prisons are segregated like that, so they kind of run themselves. I know it sounds like I'm speaking a different language. It sounds so wrong, and it sounds like we just went pre-Civil War to you guys that don't have a loved one who's incarcerated, but it's just the society inside of prison. It's the culture in there, and it's how it works. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just prison culture. That's how it is. If you guys have questions, if you want me to elaborate, if you want Adam to do a video about it, drop that in the comments below. I'm saying that because it's kind of a background you need. This guy, Wild Bill, who's the shot caller for the white guys, comes up to Aaron and he's like, we need you to take this guy's case. And he's like, absolutely not. So the shot caller, the white guy says, I thought lawyers weren't supposed to be biased. And Aaron said, well, I guess I make an exception for you, something like that. And he was like, I'm not taking the case. Then they flash to another scene where, I guess I should stop myself and say, if you have not seen this and you want to, spoiler alert. So do I think that's real and that could possibly happen inside of jail? Astounding, yes, total fact, totally legit dramatized, but I say it. Next, they flash to a scene where Aaron Wallace is in the warden's office. It goes on to say later that he is a snitch to get his way in there, but he will only snitch on the police officers. He'll only snitch on the cops, the COs. He won't snitch on other inmates. Do I think, in my experience, that that's the case? Probably not. I've never heard of a jailhouse snitch that only snitches on COs and gets his way. Because honestly, the warden always stands behind her staff or his staff. In this case, it's a female warden. They're not trying to get dirt on their staff. They're trying to get dirt on the guys or the females, the inmates, the people inside. So, mm, 
I don't know. I could be wrong though. I've never done time. I have no idea. But to me, from the experience, from what I've seen from the outside looking in, I don't see it happening. However, that's how this show is. That's how it's portrayed. Then they flash to another scene. Obviously, I'm not doing every scene, but they flash to a scene where they're showing Aaron Wallace's 16-year-old daughter, Jasmine, and her mom having a conversation. Jasmine is saying, Mom, I want to go see Dad. I didn't write it down. I can't remember her name, but her, his wife is saying, I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's going to make him more upset. And that reminds me at the visit before where she was saying you should have taken the plea and she was pissed off at him. She told him that Jasmine's just a 16 year old girl and she doesn't really want to come see him. She can't see him like that. She's making these excuses. It sounds legit. Could that be legit for a kid not wanting to go see her dad in jail at 16 years old? Of course. But now back to the scene in the kitchen, she wants to go see her dad and her mom is keeping her from him. Is that legit? Absolutely. Have I seen that before? similar situation, similar story. The reason she's keeping her from going to see her dad is because at 16 years old, their daughter got pregnant and she doesn't want to have to tell him that because she thinks it's going to break his heart. He's not there to be a dad for his daughter. And that is something huge that I see all the time that it's heartbreaking for me is that it's so hard for men to father from behind bars. Is it possible? Yes. Look at the video that I did with IJ. Uh, his dad was in prison since he was 27 years old and they run a successful business together. I'm going to post that video in the comments above. You guys need to go watch that if you haven't seen it yet after this one. But caveat, IJ is in Canada and they have family visits. So he has some sort of reality with his dad that we don't get down here in the United States. I am not taking away all the hard work and everything that IJ did that his mother did and that his father did in the way that he could. But what I'm saying is a lot of us don't get those weekends together with our incarcerated loved ones or the children with their fathers. It's really hard to be a dad from behind bars. It's really hard. So I can understand it. Let's go back to that scene. This man walks into the kitchen and it winds up that it's Aaron Wallace's former best friend who is now sleeping with and living with Aaron Wallace's wife, ex-wife, whatever it may be. And at one point that comes up during their visit and she says to him, I would still be with you. I want to be with you. I cannot be with you because you're here for life. She kind of has resentment towards him. And I get it. There is a huge amount of resentment as a prison wife that's weaved through our journeys. It's just part of it. It's part of being an emotional human being who's grieving the loss of their loved one to the prison system. The next scene that stood out to me was prosecutor and the state's attorney were walking into the courthouse and they were like, how did this happen? How did this guy that we prosecuted all these years ago, how was he in court? And they were talking about how it happened, how he got his law license. And I asked Adam if that was accurate, if he could actually have been leaving jail and going to court. He said in his experience, no. And you have to remember our experience is with federal prison. So in the feds, they would never allow that. This happened in New York state. Is it possible? Maybe if you have New York state experience, let me know in the comments below, but I think this might be a little bit more dramatized. My opinion is possibly, I would love, love, love to be able to interview and meet Isaac Wright. He's working for a law firm in New York, New Jersey, which is like 10 miles from me. I would die if I could get in touch with him and I would ask him, but my opinion as somebody who has experience in the federal system is that he was probably an inside jailhouse lawyer. He was not traveling back and forth to court. That's why they're saying this is loosely based off of a true story, but I don't know, I could be wrong there. So when the prosecutor and the attorney are talking, they were like, whatever you have to do, don't let this dude win. And it was kind of messed up, but that's the system you guys, 100% check mark truth. That is a fact right there. That is what we're dealing with all the time. Another scene was Aaron Wallace and his client who is another inmate and they're on a prison bus and they're supposed to be in court at a certain time. I wanna say, let's just say nine o'clock. Aaron's looking around and he's like, dude, you're going the wrong way. You missed our stop. And the bus driver's basically like, shut up inmate. I don't remember the exact words, but along those lines. And he's asking the guys around him on the prison bus, where are you guys going? And they said wherever they were going. And he's like, that's going to put us two hours behind. I have to be in court. You got to turn the bus around. And the bus driver's giving him grief. And he's talking to him like he's a less than human being. Totally truth. Totally get down with that being part of the true story. Because unfortunately, our loved ones are treated like that when they're inside. They flash forward to court. Aaron is running into the courtroom with his client. And he's like, I'm so sorry, Your Honor. I'm sorry, we're late. And she said, 
yeah, you should be sorry. She said, I just got a call from prison or whomever saying that you were causing such a stir on this bus that you were riling up the other inmates. They had to stop the bus. They had to get other people off, blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, that's not the case. And then they went into the fact that his number one witness had to leave because he was a police officer and he was on duty. And he got like a little bit upset. You could tell he was biting his tongue. And then he said, well, let's call my second witness to the stand. And prosecutor was like, oh, about that. He retracted his statement, da, 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 and Aaron Wallace lost it. And he was like, that's because you're tampering with my witnesses. Judge, do you see what's going on here? This is what they do. This is what they do to us. And she's like, you better calm down. You're very close to being in contempt of court. And he was just so riled up and heated and all of his pent up emotion from his own case was coming out. And he kept talking about how there was so much corruption and he had so much anger built up in him. Yes, 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 hands down, without a shadow of a doubt, check truth fact. That is something that every inmate experiences and something that every single person who supports an inmate will experience at some point or another during their incarceration, most likely throughout the whole stay. Okay, now this scene hit home for me. This was when I was watching the pilot the first time and I actually just shut it off at this scene, probably like halfway through the episode. Aaron goes back to his cell after court, after being chopped off at the knees again and again and again by the defense. And he gets in there and he just destroys his cell. He turns his cell upside down. I, as the viewer, as somebody whose loved one has experienced something very similar, started to get extremely emotional and I had to shut off the TV for the night and figured I would try again tomorrow because the exact same thing happened to Adam. He represented himself for his appeals. In federal prison, you only get three appeals. I should probably go into that more too. But Adam's second appeal was just denied. They didn't look at it. Anything just came back stamped denied. No reason. So then he had to appeal that denial instead of being able to actually appeal the case. I hope that makes sense. So when that came back, when he came back after years of working on this and doing all this, he said he went back to his cell and he just started destroying it, throwing papers, breaking things, ripping things apart, and they let him do it. All of that emotion and built up testosterone and everything that he had been working on, fighting for, he was so crushed that it all came out in this fit of rage and he destroyed his cell. And he said, after all of that emotion came out and it was just done, he felt an overwhelming sense of calm and relief. You know, it's kind of like you pop a pimple. It's hurting while you're doing it. But after all that pressure comes out, that is a gross analogy. I apologize. But it's the only thing I can think of. After all that pressure comes out, you're like, oh. And I think that's what happened for Adam. So I started reliving what happened to Adam after his appeals. Now, that was in 2005, 15 years later, still not having any relief. That was really emotional for me to watch. So check, check, yes, 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 real life experience that absolutely happens. Another thing that happens right shortly after that scene is the kid who he's representing has been inside for six years unfairly. The police destroyed evidence. The witnesses were tampered with. Now, Basically, the judge is like, you guys aren't winning. He's in contempt of court. The kid goes back and he gets high. And he said it was the first time in six years. And he told Aaron while he was high or drunk or whatever it was, he said, I just lost all hope. There's no hope left. I'm stuck here forever. And that scene to me also was a tearjerker because that is so true. How many people inside lose all hope? The system fights against you all day, every day, and you just feel so entrapped. And you feel like no matter any way you turn, your life is over. You have no control. Did you hear my paper fall? I have to acknowledge it because I know you heard it. But that part is just so sadly true. Ugh, it's just so sad that it's so true. Another thing they showed was Aaron on a cell phone with his wife because there's things that he had to ask her for that she he couldn't say over the regular jail phone. It's recorded. They constructed this scheme to forge this suicide letter that the police destroyed that the client said was there at the scene. So they show him on the cell phone and that is 100% not legal inside, but it happens all the time. So the fact that he was on a cell phone inside of prison was not fake. That is probably based off of tons and tons and tons of people's true stories. For the record, Adam does not have one, will not look at them, won't go near them inside because he can't. 
he cannot get charged with anything on the inside because he has a one-shot deal to get out. In another scene, Aaron decides that he's going to work with the white guys. He's going to take on that case if they help him write this suicide note. And during this scene, as it's playing out, you see people all over the prison stationed as lookouts. And you see them looking out for the cops coming, and then you see them telling each other when it's clear and when it's not clear. 100% hands down happens all the time when people are inside tattooing, when people are inside doing things, things, intimate things, when things that are happening that should not be happening based off of the rules in there, that is so true, totally true, they do it. Winds up that he does win this case and he gets that kid out and they're all celebrating and the grandmother of this boy comes up to him and she's like, thank you so much. Totally true. Jailhouse lawyers do get clients out all the time. There are some jailhouse lawyers that are just as good as lawyers on the outside. So absolutely 2255 motions, which are appeals in the federal system, are won by jailhouse attorneys day in and day out. Amazing. Our attorney was a jailhouse lawyer, our very good attorney who works at Georgetown Law now. It's, it's legit. It happens. People who have done time can get their law degree. It is amazing. It is incredible. And I'm so proud of these people. But yeah, that's true. The next scene that stood out to me was his daughter went to go visit him and she tells him that she's pregnant and she says, but daddy, I need you to come home. And he says, oh, this was a tearjerker for sure. He says, I used to be just like you, my family and my friends and time, but time stands still in here until something happens that proves to you that time is still going by. Time doesn't stand still out there for you too. I'm about to cry. That moment with his daughter saying that she's pregnant, he's gonna be a grandfather and she needs him, was one of those excruciatingly painful reality checks that time was going on out there and he vowed in that very moment that he would do whatever it took to get himself home on the outside. So I can only imagine what that foreshadowed to come. I can only imagine what kind of sleight of hand is gonna go on in there for him to work his way, literally work through his jailhouse attorney work, his way out of his life sentence. And he says that he is fighting for her. This whole entire fight is for his daughter. And I can relate to that so much because in a conversation I had with Adam just a few days ago, he told me, he said, I could do this. This is easy for me. He said, it's the stress that it puts on you, my mom, my dad, my family, that is the most painful for me. He said, I got the easy part, you have the hard part. And he said, I say that to the attorney all the time. And that tugged my heartstrings so hard. And I said to him, that's so sad for me to hear because it is not easy in there. It's so stressful in there. It's hard in there. And he said, I could do this. I know how to do this. I know how to do time. Oh, is that not a tearjerker, you guys? Does that not break your heart? I don't care though. If I'm the reason that he's fighting to come home, I'll be the reason that he's fighting to come home. His family will be the reason that he's fighting to come home. This man's daughter is his reason to fight to come home. Sometimes you need that outside perspective. It's like a drug addict who finally gives up drugs because she learns that she's pregnant. Now she has something else to fight for. It's not always codependency when you're fighting for somebody else because you love them. It's hope. It's your why. It's what ignites that fire every single day. If you have a loved one who's in prison, you're probably their why. Okay. I can't wait for tonight's episode because they show a scene where his wife comes to visit him and she says something along the lines of, it's you and me. And it shows their hands sliding down the glass. Ah! And then they show a scene of her with, I want to say maybe her father, her parents. And she was like, just because we're not together anymore doesn't mean I will ever leave him. I will never leave his side because he doesn't deserve to be where he is. And he deserves me in his corner. Chills up and down my body because I think I've said those words are very similar words many times throughout my relationship with Adam. So that's it for today. If you guys want me to do a follow-up every week, I absolutely will because I love this show. I just think it's amazing that it's on mainstream TV. It is on ABC, a hit network. It is outing so much corruption in the system and I think it is a huge step to reforming our criminal justice system. We need it so badly. We've taken little steps and I want to say they should be big steps with things like the First Step Act, but we have so much pushback from the people who are in those places of power who don't want to lose that power and they don't for some reason want our loved ones to come home. 
I am so grateful to 50 Cent. I'm so grateful to Isaac Wright for sharing his story and allowing it to be told. I am so grateful to everybody for putting this on because this is how we change the system. You guys keep staying strong, keep loving strong, keep supporting one another through this journey because you're one day closer to it all being behind you. Lots of love from my heart and Adam's heart to all of yours. We'll see you beautiful ladies and gentlemen in the next one. Bye guys. They created a character named Aaron what? They created a character named Alan. <laughs> this needs to be its own video of just F ups. Okay. <clears throat> they created a character named Aaron Wallace based loosely off of a man, a man. I can't, I can't do this right now. How are we 13 minutes in and I haven't said anything yet?